Hey guys, Pascal here. And in this video, I'm gonna go over a call with a client that's thinking about going back to school. And they're wondering, how should I help fund going back to school? Should I take money out of my 401k? Should I use my stock portfolio? Should I take on loans? And in this call, we're gonna go over the analysis and the different things you need to think about and determine what is the best move for you if you're planning to go back to school. So if you want more content, smash the like button and subscribe to the channel. A lot more content coming. We post at least once a week with lots of great financial information to help you build your personal portfolio. Hey Gail, how are you? Hey Pascal, I'm good. How are you? Doing good. Just uh, working on setting everything up here, you know, playing with the new equipment. So Gail, what's your question today? My question, Pascal, is that regarding to 401ks, I know that last year there was that special COVID-19 deal that they were doing for people who were pulling out of their 401ks due to the pandemic. I missed that window, but I was just checking my um, balance, and it's grown a whole lot more than I thought it would. And I'm not even putting money in, but awesome. so it's just growing on the plan that it's assigned to. Um, and yeah, I don't know if I should take some out and invest. The only caveat is that I plan on. Um, I don't. I don't know if you. Yeah, I told you. I'm going up to seminary soon. Um, so I do plan to switch out of my current job as a, an employee and instead do independent contractor work for them. So mm -hmm. I don't have like, you know, loan options as an employee. Um, yeah. And I'm going to be going to school soon and having to pay, you know, pretty expensive tuition. So wondering if I should touch it, wondering if I should do something with it or just leave it alone because it happens to be growing perfectly fine without me doing anything. So one... It really depends on what you're investing. So understand that your investment horizon, you're looking at liquidating in the next year to two to help cover college costs, living costs, since you're gonna be bringing in less money now since you're gonna be part-time. So you have to consider all those factors. And you don't wanna have short-term money in a long-term investment. So back in 2008, when the market crashed, I had money in stocks that I was intending to use for real estate. And my, my, my idea was, well, let me, let me, it's gonna go up more in the stock market than if I put it into, say, a CD. Uh, and then when I find a good deal, if the market goes down, I'll pull it out of the stocks and buy the, buy the good deal. The issue is, is when the housing market went down, the stock market went down hard as well, and I lost over 50% of my value in my stocks for that period of time. So if you're planning to live on that money, you, you should have it in a conservative uh, investment. So if your stocks went up a lot, it's likely that they went up because you're, in, you're heavy in like the, the tech space and uh, maybe emerging markets and so on. You might have your stocks in, uh, in, in countries which currencies are now considered stronger than compared to the US currency because the US currency has actually dropped in, this, in its strength. So now if you've invested in, in, in other countries, that money, the exchange rate makes that worth more than, than what it is here. So there's a lot of factors involved. I can't really say what is the reason why your stock uh, value went up because I don't know what you're invested in. But overall, if you look at the main, the main idea, which is I'm going to be using this money, where, what should I do with, with my account? So I would plan ahead and determine how much you're gonna be using each year so you can decide where you should put your money because your investment timeline is going to determine what, where you should have your money. Uh, part two, um, yes, there was a um, penalty forgiveness for pulling money out for COVID. And you could, took, pay, you could take out $100,000 without a, without a penalty uh, and then you would also a available to take out $100,000 as a loan. Now, with 
that said, you still would owe the tax. So if it's a good idea to take money out of your 401k when you have lower income, so you can avoid paying a higher tax bracket. So uh, an example, I had a client that was making 150,000 a year and then they took out 150,000 out of their 401k because they were buying a house and moving to Florida to retire. And it would have been good if they met with me prior to doing that because I would have told them, don't pull the money out in December because now you're gonna have $300,000 of earned income. Pull the money out in January when you're retired because now you only have 100,000, 150,000 per year. So now, uh, so it would have avoided them bumping themselves up to a higher tax bracket. So uh, keep conscious on, on when you're planning to do uh, the withdrawal and, and how much, because all those factors should come into play for, on, in your decision. Okay, I don't, I personally was not planning on withdrawing from my 401k because I have enough in my um, regular stocks mm -hmm. to carry me over. But okay. I just noticed that my 401k was growing and I was thinking, I wonder if it would be a good idea to invest in it. Um, but yeah, if, if, if I even have good options to do that when I'm not going to be considered an employee anymore. Or now that, now that we're talking about it, I don't know, is it better to take money out of my 401k or is it better to take it out of my stocks as far as the tax implications or would they kind of just be the same? Well, with your stocks, if you... If you liquidate stocks and there isn't a taxable gain, then you're not paying tax on that money. For example, if you bought uh, $1,000 worth of stocks and they're worth $1,000, you're not paying any tax on that. If you bought $1,000 worth of stocks and then sold it for $1,200, you're only paying tax on the $200. If you've had it for over a year, you're roughly in the 15% tax bracket for long-term capital gains. If you kept it less than a year, you're at the 35% tax bracket for long-term capital gains or short-term capital gains. 35% for short-term capital gains. Now, with, with your 401k, when you pull that money out, you're pulling out as earned income. So it's, it's being pulled out as earned income, so it's based off of your tax bracket. It could be 15%, 20 25%, 30 It depends on your tax bracket. So that would come into play as well. Um, now, because you're, you're asking multiple questions, which is where should I put my money out? And the next question you're asking is, I have a lot of gains. Should I change out of my stocks into another asset, which could be safer or better returns? You're asking multiple questions in this. So are you wondering, should you sell your stocks? And invest it in something else. No, it was it was more specifically about my four hundred one k. I wasn't planning on touching my stocks, and it broke up a little bit earlier. I couldn't um, when you were when you had responded to that. I wasn't sure if you were saying it made a difference whether or not I pulled out of my stocks or pulled out of my four hundred one k. There is a there is a tax difference. So there's okay. for your stocks. Because remember, you own stocks in your 401k and you own stocks outside of your 401k. So the 401k is a wall that is tax deferred. So if you pull that out in your normal account, your normal um, you know, market account, it's long-term gain, long gains is 15%. Short-term gains are 35%. And then your 401k taxable gains are based off of your earned income. So whatever your earned income level is. That's why it's better for you to take money out of your 401k when you, were, when you made less money in a year compared to taking money out when you made more money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you're, you can, when you leave your job, you can also transfer your 401k into a self-directed IRA. If you're going into being self-employed, you can actually transfer your money into a self-directed 401k. And you can then use that money, you know, there is self-directed 401ks that you could buy crypto, you could buy real estate with it. So you do have other options other than being in stocks or mutual funds. Nice, I didn't know that. Okay, that's good for me to consider, a self-directed IRA. Yeah, my, um, my- Preferably, my preferably, Sorry. preferably you'd be in a self-directed 401k because if you invest in real estate in a self-directed 
IRA, you could be subject to EBITDA, and, uh, which is an extra tax. And if you use a self-directed 401k, uh, it avoids the EBITDA tax when you're buying real okay. estate with your retirement funds. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, my regular stocks, they're all long-term. Like, they, these are stocks that have been sitting there for a couple of years. Um, is 15% the max that tax would be on those? No, they can go up. They can go up, say, 20%. Um, it depends on the amount of money you you made in the year. It's based off of your income bracket. Okay. I mean, yeah, what, what do you think? Do you think I should take anything out if I'm doing okay or if they're growing? Um, you know, yeah. it's, it's difficult because, again, I don't know how much money you're making now, and I don't know how much you're going to make on part-time. I don't know how much money you're spending. I don't know how much money it's going to be your in seminary. What I can say this is... Having a diversified portfolio is always helpful. Having some money in stocks, some money in crypto, some money in real estate, it's very helpful. Having investments in something that's going to bring you in cash is good. And having your investments in something that's gonna bring you long-term gains is good. So basically the more diversified you are, the better you're gonna do with the waves of the market. And being that I'm a contrarian, anytime something falls that I like, I don't sell and get out, I buy more. And when something I like gets more expensive, I usually sell it and I buy another item that I like that's, that is cheaper uh, compared to value. Okay, yeah, I don't think I can really do real estate out here though, like it's not enough because of the market and uh, the West Coast is ridiculous film. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, I, yeah. I'm, with real kind of estate. Like where to make a purchase on the East Coast. With real estate, you can always do, uh, you know, invest part of like a fund. So mm -hmm. then you own a share of a property. I just finished a uh, Zoom meeting and we were going over um, all these different properties that I have under contract in Old Southeast of St. Pete, right by the water. So uh, there are a whole bunch of multi-units that are like half a block from the water on this um, really nice area by Lassing Park. So it's a park that's on the Gulf of Mexico, so you can actually swim. And most of the people that go to this park you usually can go there if you live in the neighborhood because there's not really parking space. So it's pretty private uh, for the residents of this community. And it's right underneath uh, the airport um, in St. Pete, right by you know, USF St. Pete and so on. But the point is you can buy part of, uh, you know, real estate investment groups, you know, syndications, and um, those, there is other options. That's actually one of the things you can think about is because if you sold your stocks, you would have a taxable gain. But if you use that money and invest it in a syndication and that syndication did a cost segregation model and a cost segregation model gives you significant tax write-offs, you know, potentially, mm -hmm. you can offset the, the tax you're being paid from your 401k withdrawal with the tax write-off that you're getting uh, from the real estate investment. And it could almost come to a wash, potentially could come to a wash. So now you moved money out of earned income to passive income. So it's uh, definitely a, an option and it's interesting. Uh, at the same time, you could then use a withdrawal, that withdrawal, and uh, let's just say hypothetically you did a $50,000 withdrawal. And then you could then take your cash from your stocks and put $50,000 back into a 401k account, but this time you invest it into a Roth 401k. So now you, well, because now you moved money from a higher tax to a lower tax, and you have an ability to refund your 401k, and now you're refunding your 401k in a Roth account, which means when you withdraw it out in the future, you have no tax. Mm. So you made one move to, you you know, you're playing chess here, right? We made one yeah. move from a high tax bracket to a low tax bracket. We moved from one low tax bracket into a no tax bracket. Nice, I see. And yeah. people do that probably regularly, huh? Not regularly. Only people that have 
people only people that have like advisors that know like this level of uh, the game, right? Like I'm I'm going to events with the same advisors that Robert Kiyosaki has, right? Like I'm getting uh, you know high level advice. I'm actually gonna be at a on a a, a trip. Uh, Robert Kiyosaki is gonna be there. Peter Schiff is gonna be there, um, and and a whole bunch of other really um, smart people, you know. And it's learning from these advisors and these advisors' advisors, right? Uh, and it's all the newest, um, you know, tips and tricks of the trade. Cool. It's it's pretty exciting, you know. Like you can get geeked out on it, you know, with all yeah. all the info. Yeah. That's really cool. One, yeah. Somebody out there is gonna be like Pascal Corkis is gonna be there. <laughs> Actually, I was at a couple of these events with. Um, you know, in these groups, and like people will come up and be like, Pascal, I follow you on Instagram. Oh, I love your stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> I was like, thanks, thanks. I appreciate it. So wow, it's. Wow, look so, at you, Oh, thank God. Thank God. You know, I'm just trying yeah. to, I'm just trying to help. So yeah. Oh, and again, you could buy crypto and Bitcoin. And, you know, if you can, if you make that move and now you actually use some of that money in your Roth account and go into a, a, a Roth 401k that is in, invested in crypto. And, you know, we have another massive bull run. And, you know, some of these people that I'm listening to, they're saying Bitcoin's going to hit $12 million by 2031. Like, again, and let's just say that it doesn't hit 12, it just hits 1 million. That's still a 20x move in a Roth 401k, so there's no tax. Wow. You know? That's really interesting. Okay. Lots to think about. Lots to think about. Cool. Well, thanks, Pascal. Yeah, I think I need to consider, um, like you said, I need to probably really sit down and look at my financials as a whole before I get too excited. Um, and then, yeah, I might I might call you back about some of those other options with the um, self-directed 401k and the, I forget what was the name of that, um, like hedge or the, the fund thing that you were discussing. Syndication? Uh, a syndication yeah. is... Um, Basically, a syndication, to simplify it, is an a, a investment group, right? It's a group of people that come together and they buy properties together. A syndication normally has a syndicator, and I'm the, syndi I'm the syndicator, right? I'm the, the general partner that does all the work, where there's a bunch of limited partners that get the benefit from the work that I do. Um, this is a kind of more and more common thing. If you imagine it, it's I'm almost like an, a fund manager or an asset manager, except I'm not buying and selling stocks. I'm buying uh, and managing real estate. And uh, so I'm basically a, a real asset manager. Cool. Yeah, that one, that one sounded interesting to me, but I, do, I think you're right. I think I need to look at my um, plan as a whole long-term purposes and make sure I'm not doing something I shouldn't. Do you think though, should I be worried about trying to get it out before there's like a crash or something? So, I've been saying that there was going to be a crash end of 2019, beginning of 2020. And if the, if the government, and this had nothing to do with COVID, we have extreme issues with the amount of personal debt that people in this country have. We have issues that the, they're not making enough money. The average person is not bringing enough income. The issue that it's not going to easily be fixed because most people, the people that are not getting well-paid jobs aren't educated. There's a ton of well-paying jobs out there that cannot be filled because there's not educated people there to fill them. So we have real systemic problems in what COVID did is re revealed it and it should have crashed the market. And even without COVID, it was going to crash because in, in like quarter four of 2019, we were having uh, a, 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 like about $500 million of money disappearing in overnight banking which no one could explain where that money was disappearing to. So there's a, there was going to be a significant banking uh, problem in this country. And then since they passed the stimulus, they've pumped out trillions of dollars, and that's kind of been filling in a lot of the black holes, but they still haven't fixed the problem. And, and I've also mentioned, I just mentioned multiple problems, and none of them have really been fixed. So the question, it's not a question of does our, our system have uh, uh, like cancer? Like it has a cancer and 
it's gonna have to pay. Uh, it's gonna get really sick. And, and it's the question of like, again, the doctor saying, you have cancer and you're gonna die. The question is, are you gonna die in six months or 18 months? I don't know, but you're gonna eventually have to pay for this. And um, in the sense of a cold, the longer you go without sleeping it off and actually resting and recovering, the worse it's gonna be. So that's what's happening with our economy. We're kicking the can down the road and it's gonna be worse later. Now the question then comes to when, Pascal? When is it gonna get worse? From what I can tell, in the sense of the market overall, it would be at least another year before we really see anything happening if something's gonna happen. Under a year, it's not likely. Now, the next part of it is real estate market. If you're in like say Florida, Texas, Arizona, it has probably at least another two years because there's such a high demand and so many people moving here that it's gonna be at least two years before we see any cracks in, in there, especially with the eviction moratorium and um, the foreclosure moratorium. Not until those properties start coming out are we gonna see anything. And it takes roughly two years for those properties to hit the market, hit the street. So they're not gonna start allowing evictions and foreclosures until September. Like that's the whisper, September. So it, you're looking at two years from September before you see something like that happen. So you're in now into like 2023 before you really start seeing something. And with my strategy of real estate, I'm not gonna be as affected as other people. Um, we're all gonna be affected, but you know, it's about reducing the impact of how you're gonna be affected. Okay, so I've got two years potentially at the very latest to try and lower my impact, I guess, but I wouldn't wanna wait probably. I wanna, would, would wanna set things up, but yeah, I don't wanna be in a situation then where I'm kind of looking at what I have now as far as my investments and they look good now, but I don't wanna wait after two years and then I can't rely on them, you know? Yes, unless again, the biggest thing that we need to remember is that we have to remember what is a long-term investment, what is a short-term investment, and what is money we're gonna be using shortly, like in the next few months. You don't wanna be having your short-term money and a long-term investment, finding out that that long-term investment crashed, and now you're stuck, because if you liquidate, you're gonna take your loss, and if you don't liquidate, because you're gonna ride it out, you don't have the money you need to use for its intended purpose. You might have to continue working and avoid you know, going to school full time. So you, you have to be conscious of where, what position do I, wanna put, do I wanna put myself in? Okay, a couple of things to consider then. Yes, but you're smart, you'll figure it out. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna kind of uh, go to the same sort of uh, response that you've had, I mean it really is God. Like there's nothing I did to these to my stocks to to do what they're doing now. You know what I mean? Like, well, I did nothing special. I didn't even, yeah, they're just doing this on their own. <laughs> well, obviously, thank God and, and glory to God for, for everything he does for us. He's very good to us. And, but remember, you know, get up and I'll get up with you. Go and I'll go with you. So there is that purpose that even though we put uh, our faith in God, uh, our faith needs to be working right? So it needs to be through action that we, we show our faith, right? Like in the sense of doing good for others. We don't do good for others because we have to do it. We do good, good for others because God does good for us. And this is a reflection of God's goodness through us. So at the same time, you went through faith and invested because there's a lot of people out there that are Christians, but are not faithful because they don't put any of their money in investments. They don't believe anything into like debt and, and, and using it to, to invest in real estate and, and they are not as faithful. So, you know, for those with little faith, little is given. Those with a lot and do a lot, get more. So you're doing great, Gail. You know, I have confidence in you. So when you're ready, come back. I got more answers for you and uh, let me know how it goes. Thanks, Basco. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Have a great night. You too. Bye. Bye.